raise your hand if you ever sat in an algebra class and asked yourself, when am I ever going to need to know this? <laughs> oh, there, <laughs> I see we're in good company here. I'm here to talk to you about a way to settle that question for students by making algebra truly real. And if we do it just right, we might be able to get universal computer science education for every kid in America. So how are we going to do that? Let's take a step back. Uh, this is me. Uh, apparently, in 1983, I really loved bunnies. <laughs> God, I hope that's a Halloween costume. Um, <laughs> I also loved to teach. So when I learned how to tie my shoes, or make toast, or make scrambled eggs, I loved teaching my friends how to do the same. And I loved computers, loved tinkering with them. I was the kid who subscribed to computer magazines, loved computers. And I was a pretty good student, but I'll level with you. I was decent at math, but I didn't really understand it. So I was the kid who knew the formulas, and I knew when to use them for the most part, but I didn't know why. I didn't know why they worked. But I got good grades, and I felt like I was doing OK. So I went off to college to major in computer science and education, the two things I loved more than anything else in this world. And I had a life plan. You know how well those go. <laughs> the plan was I would go work for the private sector, make my millions, and then pursue my passion for education. And so that's how it started out. Graduated, went to go work for uh, a small software company in Redmond, Washington. And uh, after a couple of, of months in the private sector, I realized that doing it as a nine to five wasn't really for me. So scratch that, new plan, <laughs> skip over the making millions, <laughs> I'm going to teach computer science. And so I went from school to school to school right here in Boston, asking the principals, hey, do you, do you need a computer science teacher? I want to be your computer science teacher. And the response was, actually, we don't really have much of a need for a computer science teacher. But could you teach trigonometry? Could you teach algebra? Could you teach calculus? Because that's where the need was. So scratch that. New, new plan. <laughs> uh, I guess I'll teach math. <laughs> and what I learned then was that for many schools then and even today, computer science is nice to have, but algebra is a must have. And I didn't totally understand why then, but I do now, and I want to share a couple of those reasons. So first. Look, we all care about STEM. Everyone's all excited about STEM now, right? Well, algebra is the gateway to all STEM fields. So yes, if you never pass algebra, you probably won't be a mathematician. But we often forget that without algebraic functions, you ain't modeling projectile motion in physics. You're not balancing chemical equations. You're not modeling bacterial growth uh, in biology. And hey, you want to go into economics, accounting, or finance. Without functions, you can't even think about compound interest. So if you care about STEM at all, Algebra is a must-have. <laughs> Second, a wise man once said, it is all about the Benjamins. <laughs> and a study looked at the correlation between grades kids get in high school and the amount of money they earn later. And it turns out that out of all grades, the grade a student gets in their first year of algebra is the most strongly correlated with the amount of money that child will make for the rest of his or her life. So this isn't just about an achievement gap. This gets into issues of equity and poverty, too. And finally, whether you love them or hate them, we live in an era of high-stakes testing and standardized tests. And when we talk about, oh, America's falling behind other countries, we're talking about the math test. And guess which part of the math test keeps us up at night? It's the algebra. It's the word problem, stuff like that. So given how important algebra is, how do we feel about it as a country? <laughs> we're terrified, <laughs> right? So why? Why is algebra so hard? I went back to grad school and spent eight years researching this very thing. To understand why algebra is so hard, you have to think first about what we tell students math is. So let's do an experiment. Let's pretend everyone in this room right now is three or four or five years old. We've, we've just learned how to add. And so for, for all of you young boys and girls, math looks like this. And a teacher like me says, when I count to three, I just want you to shout out the answer. All right, we're going to do this. All right, kids, one, two, three. Oh, fantastic. Gold stars for all of you. And maybe the way you got it was you held up four fingers, and then two fingers, and then you counted the fingers. <laughs> but what you just learned, even though I didn't tell you, was that math is a process. And the, your job is to compute the process and spit out a number. And as we got older, we added to the process. Subtraction, uh, multiplication, one, two, three. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, division, um, solving for unknowns, right? One, two, three. Beautiful, you guys are great. And then many years later, we get into algebra. One, two, three. What's the problem? 
The reason we can't answer that question is because it ain't a question. <laughs> yeah, it's true, there's still a process going on here, but algebra is the first time where math ceases to be just about a process and starts being about these abstract objects called functions. And an algebra teacher will ask his or her students, is this function linear or exponential? What is its image? Is it one-to-one -one or is it onto? And remember, if you're a child who still thinks your job is to compute the process, these questions aren't just hard, they don't make sense. Math itself has changed. And so I'm fond of saying that, you know, arithmetic is to math as spelling is to journalism. You can be the best speller in the world, <laughs> but that doesn't mean you're a great writer. And you can be the best arithmetician in the world, but that doesn't mean you've been taught to think about abstract objects like functions and later derivatives, integrals, manifolds, topologies, and so on. So we gotta get kids thinking about functions in a new way, right? That's, that's the critical thing. So I thought back in 2004, maybe programming can help, right? That's my, my background. So programming to the rescue, it turns out, not a new idea. In 1960, <laughs> Seymour Papert published a groundbreaking paper on a language called Logo. And in this paper, Papert actually said one of the things he thought students would learn is algebra. Programming has functions, math has functions. And since then, we've tried all kinds of languages and tools to get kids coding. Often, it's explicitly with the goal of math. Many states right now allow schools to count a coding class for math credit. And even if they don't allow that, often the teacher who winds up teaching the programming class is a math teacher. So, fast forward to today. Everybody's coding now. We've got the hour of code, tens of millions of kids are coding. Raise your hand if you've ever done some coding. Wow, wow. And, and now that everybody's coding, everyone's doing great math. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, no, actually, that, that didn't happen at all. So why? I'm gonna let you guys in on a dirty secret. Most of the programming languages that we teach in schools these days really don't have much to do with math at all. I'll give you three examples. Let's talk about numbers, right? You need numbers to do math. So, uh, one divided by two. We know what that is, right? It's like 0.5 or a fraction, like one half or something. Yeah, well, in Java, it's actually zero. <laughs> and uh, if you find that confusing, good. Uh, <laughs> so as a math teacher, that's really problematic. So let's talk about variables, right? We all know how variables work. So if you've done any work in Python or JavaScript or Scratch, you know that you can assign the value 10 into x, and then later we can add two and you know, reassign that new value back into x, and now x is 12. And this is perfectly good code. If you're a math teacher in the room, you're about to take your rings off because if you subtract x from both sides, we just proved that zero equals two. <laughs> and then we get to functions, right? Here's functions. I, you don't even wanna know. <laughs> it's, it's awful, right? They violate the vertical line test. Functions often don't produce any value at all. It's a mess. Now, just to be clear, I'm not suggesting these languages are bad. Far from it. These are fantastic, beautiful languages and you should all learn them. I'm merely suggesting that you want to use the right tool for the job. And if your job is teaching math, maybe these are a problem. <laughs> so I had an idea, and later I was joined by some incredible researchers. And the idea was, what if we built a curricular module, we called it Bootstrap, and the idea was simple. We're gonna start using a different kind of programming language, a language that is mathematical. So numbers, variables, and functions act the same way they do in the math book. And then we need to have a real curriculum. So I don't just mean a list of fun programming activities, but everything from homework assignments to rubrics to slides, you name it. Then we built a pedagogy because there's more to being a good teacher than having a great textbook. So what does it look like to teach the class? And both of these things had to be aligned to standard mathematics so that any math teacher can take a look at it and say, yeah, I see how this applies. And finally, we wanted to make sure kids could build something cool. So every bootstrap student would build a video game of their own design using pure algebra. So that was the idea, we started it out. Uh, we uh, actually gave the first workshop for math teachers five years ago today. And uh, then something interesting happened recently, coding got trendy, right? All of a sudden there's this national CS for all effort. It's like the last bipartisan issue there is. <laughs> Everyone's pumped about CS for all. But let me ask you, when we say CS for all, all means everyone, right? Well, it turns out most of the proposals aren't about all students, they're about all schools, which means a city can have an after-school coding club at every school, shut the box and claim, we've got CS for all. But who shows up at these after-school opt-in programs? Well, 
They tend to be fairly male, they tend to be fairly white, they tend to be fairly affluent, because whenever you treat computer science as something extra, the kids who opt in are the kids who are interested and have the means, and the kids who don't, won't. We don't think that's right. We think it should be all students. So how do we get there? Well, we gotta do four things. Right now, you have to get certified as a physics teacher, a history teacher, an English teacher. So number one, we need in all 50 states a computer science teacher certification. And we're a long way from there. So we got a lot of years and a lot of dollars to, to build this. Then, we have to recruit and train tens of thousands of dedicated computer science teachers, which will take more years and more dollars. And assuming none of them go off to Silicon Valley and they all enter the classroom, we have to pay their salaries which means thousands of teacher salaries. That's billions of extra dollars per year added to the national education budget forever. And even if we solve all those problems, there's a finite number of hours in the school day and rooms in the school building. So where are these computer science classes gonna fit? Well, I suppose we could cut like theater, art, and music, right? <laughs> we already did. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so seriously, this is a problem because we need kids to be successful at algebra. We already cut everything else. Where are these going to fit? Well, what if we had a radical idea? What if we changed the way we thought about computer science? What if we just cherry picked the parts that could be part of math? Well, then you could leverage the billions of dollars and thousands of teachers that already reach all students in America. And we could get CS for all in years instead of decades at a cost of millions instead of billions. Well, wait a second, that's a problem we know how to solve. So going back to the earlier research that we did, we found that in that bootstrap thing, students actually did better in certain standard pencil and paper algebra tasks. So they were doing better at math. But the teachers found that the students were more engaged because instead of computing a ladder leaning against a brick wall, they're using the same distance formula to figure out if an alien hit, I don't know, a piece of broccoli in space. And suddenly they're engaged. And the students liked the programming and asked for more. So fast forward to now, five years later, currently this tiny research project now serves more than 15,000 students every single year. And you know what? We're very pleased with the scale, but we're particularly proud of our diversity. Because of those 15,000, more than 43% are girls and young women, more than 46% of these students are African American or Latino, and these students are in math classes primarily, taught by teachers with no computing background. So how did we do this, right? How did we get this kind of scale and this kind of diversity in one shot? Well, I'll tell you, we didn't do it by developing a special purpose band-aid, right? A math intervention, a CS intervention, an intervention just for girls or just for students of color. The, the takeaway here is when you're dealing with big systemic problems like this, you need to take a step back. Look at the problem as a whole. And if you solve it by design using the teachers that already reach all students, Instead of having computer science and algebra success be these obstacles for one another, where they're competing for precious minutes and dollars, instead of one being the locked door to the other, instead it's the key. And we can make algebra truly real for all students, and at the same time, we get computer science for all. Thank you very much. You guys are wonderful. <laughs>